Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our January edition of WESC webinars. I'm Josie with WESC, and today I am joined by, Mark, by Michael of Make More Creative. Our topic today is Introduction to Brand Jitsu. Understanding Brand Jitsu enables you uh, how to find, shape, and share your unique story while also giving you a strategy to address and mediate the top five reasons for failure. Ranjitsu is a, method, is a methodology anyone can use to quickly and effectively shape and share their brand so everyone gets it. So thanks, Michael, for joining us today, and please feel free to start whenever you're ready. Awesome. Hey, thank awesome. you. Thanks so much uh, for joining me and, and for having me here. This is awesome. Um, I usually do talks where I'm walking around, so getting uh, being in a chair is, is going to be a challenge, so I'm going to try and stay in camera. Um, I do see that that chat bot is down there, so I'm I'm thinking that uh, if you have questions throughout, uh, go ahead and drop them in that chat bot. Uh, and if I can, I'll answer them right away. But probably what I'll end up doing is just save them all at the very very end. Um, so if that sounds great, I'm just gonna jump right in and uh, take you guys through Brand Jitsu. And I guess the first thing to know about it is uh, well, I'm a bit cranky. Sorry, I'm just going to pause for one sec. So, uh, so you're not, maybe you guys can just check in with me really quick. Um, I'm just going to do a little bit of talking, watching the, the chat come in. Uh, let me know if I'm still crackly. I'll see if there's something I can do on my end to mediate that. Wait for a couple more people to chime in here. It is me, Michael Dargan. I'm here talking about brand Jitsu. We're just doing a Hmm. Josie, any ideas here? I'm cracking up. I haven't done anything yet, so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can get a good audio signal. And uh, let's see. And we now have zero sound. I'm just going to go turn off the heater. Uh, it is minus 33 here in Calgary, which is where I'm based. Uh, so I'm going to turn it off and see if that helps. All right. I am back and uh, just waiting here to see what happens. Please let me know if this sounds any better whatsoever. Um, the heater is still going, but uh, it will get out here in a second. Ah, great, it is better. All right, well, I'm just I'm going to continue. Uh, just you know, jump in if it becomes um, unintelligible. Let me know. Uh, otherwise, I'll just go through it. We've got an hour together, and I imagine it'll take about 40 minutes or so. And um, so, my name is Michael Dargi, and I'll just give you a brief sort of overview of who I am and uh, why I'm doing this talk. And uh, basically, I've been in this industry for pretty much my entire career. I've been helping companies uh, figure out their brand and share it with the world through advertising. And uh, I own a creative agency. I used to work with a company called Service Intelligence and I worked with Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 brands. And uh, when I left that company back in 2005, I uh, went and started my own company, basically helping small to medium-sized companies or entrepreneurs figure out who they are in the world and share that. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today comes from that experience for the last 15 years, as well as uh, I'm a performer with the Loose Moves Theater Company. Uh, uh, I heard you, but no longer hear anything. Uh, and now I hope that it comes back. Um, so. I'm with the Loose News Theatre Company, which is an improvisation theatre company, so we do improv comedy every week. And if you've heard of um, Whose Line Is It Anyways, it basically comes from Loose News Theatre, a guy named Keith Johnstone. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I'm also got a podcast that in 81 different countries. Uh, I'm currently nominated for uh, Outstanding Business Series, which is kind of cool. Anyway, you can learn more about me down at MichaelDargy.com and make more creative 
I'm not here to talk about myself. I'm here to talk about Ranjitsu and uh, specifically why am I doing this talk? And uh, basically, Canadian businesses have an 11% success rate. And that's right out of a stat 10 study. Uh, essentially, 95,000 businesses start every year in Canada, 85,000 go away. Now, that doesn't mean that 85,000 of that 95,000 go away. It's just, you know, over time, that's the attrition uh, of Canadian businesses. And of the top 10 reasons, I know we said five um, earlier, but seven of them, seven of those reasons are directly related to brand. And that is a uh, basic uh, lack of strategic and effective leadership, because if you don't know where you're going, how are you going to lead people, and especially your customers? And a failure to uh, build an employee tribe is you know, critical to this as well, so that people know who you are and uh, you know, what you're doing and where you're going so that they can be advocates for you. And failure to connect with your target audience, uh, that's fairly obvious as well and uh, failure to deliver real value. Because if you don't know what you're putting out into the world, um, you know how do you know that you're actually putting out uh, value to your customers? Um, and <laughs> just ducking under the camera here, uh, lack of authenticity and transparency. And, and this will come down to the you know, sort of the first part of brand jitsu, which I'll get to shortly. And uh, you know, unable to compete against the big guys. And as small customers, uh, oh, don't, <laughs> don't move. Whatever I did made it better. That's awesome. Um, sorry. Uh, so unable to complete, uh, compete against sort of market leaders. Uh, this is crucial that the, the small companies can um, basically have what I call corporate maturity. So they can compete with those big companies right out of the gate if you set up your brand properly. And... Um, this is stuff that I've been doing for the last 15 years with businesses, and it seems to work really, really well. Um, and what I'd like to do is share that entire methodology with you during this time that we have together. So basically, Brand Jitsu is a practical and effective methodology to build or pivot a meaningful brand uh, in as short amount of time as possible. So uh, earlier in the slide, you may have noticed I used to uh, be into Japanese jiu-jitsu. So I taught Japanese jiu-jitsu for a lot of time, a lot of years. And one of the things about Japanese jiu-jitsu is that if you can't learn a technique in three minutes, then it's going to be useless to you in combat. So it's not going to be able to help you out when you're in trouble. And I took that concept and brought it into brand work in that you don't have to spend um, you know, months or years developing your brand for it to be usable. Yeah, it actually can happen very, very quickly. Um, now, it, it will take, you know, months and years to perfect that brand and to, you know, make it perfect. But in order to make it usable and effective and meaningful, you can do that right away. Um, so basically what I've done is I've created this framework where you can find, shape and share your brand uh, or your story so everybody gets it. Uh, and story is a big thing in brand work right now. Um, and, I, you know, really it has been for the entire time because it's essentially how to tell a story to an audience. Um, and speaking of which, this entire thing is built from the basics of making up stories on stage. So um, <laughs> think about not having a live audience in front of you. I'm trying not to mow down the words. So I'm going to slow down a little bit. Um, doing improv theater if you can imagine a theater with 200 people in it and you've got a stage and as you walk on stage uh, you have no idea what it is that you're going to do you just you're going to tell a story to an audience but you have no idea what that story is um, and that is very similar to starting a business or being in business is that you're on a really big stage and your audience which is all your customers or potential customers has no idea who you are and, and what you do so if we take this from the stage perspective, um, the, the guy who invented a lot of this stuff, and he's world renowned, his name is Keith Johnston. Uh, there's a link down at the bottom of my slide there. Um, he basically uh, rightly said that in order for people to be, um, you know, interested or engaged in that story, to want to watch it, to have a story worth watching, you need to create what's called platform. And that is who you are, where you are, 
what you're doing and who you're with and specifically what your relationship is to that person uh, that you're on stage with. Uh, and once you create that platform, then the entire audience goes, oh, okay, I now understand you know, where this is taking place and who these people are. And I understand roughly the shape of that story um, and specifically that circle of expectations. So what can happen within this story? And you know that can happen very quickly. You can set that platform up within the first 10 seconds or the first minute of your scene. Uh, so if we take that concept and we put that into uh, our work in brand work, uh, it becomes very simple. So I'm gonna jump over here. Um, so platform, which I just described, is creating that scenario on stage, which is who you are, where you are, what you're doing and who you're with. And then once you have that, you can then tilt that scene. So within that circle of expectations, something interesting can happen. And tilt, uh, you can look at that sort of as the catalyst or the change in the scene, the emotional change or being altered. So in order for, you know, uh, to use this in brand work, I look at this as platform being sort of the DNA or the, the base of your brand. And then the tilt being kind of the personality, sort of the, the fun bits and how you speak. Uh, and that's what we're gonna be building on. So um, a quick thing here before we move forward, and uh, I think it's something that's really worth noting at the beginning is that even though it's your brand and it's your business, this entire thing that we're building is not about you. It is 100% about you know the people who are buying your stuff. It's about your audience. It's about um, creating a hero. Um, and there's a, a book called Story Brand that talks uh, a lot about this concept, uh, which I really like. And the idea is that you are, as a business, as an entrepreneur, you are essentially a guide for the heroes of your story. And those heroes are the people that, you know, they need something from you and something that only you can provide. And you're there to support them on that journey. So if you come at your brand from that perspective, um, that makes a huge impact right out of the gate. There's a, a thing that I call the we to you ratio. And I, I do this a lot with customers or with my clients where I'll go to their website, especially when they're having troubles, and I'll do a quick uh, scan. So I actually count how many times they say we, we do this, we do that, we're amazing, we're great, versus you, uh, you know, you like this or you need that or uh, you're looking for this. And the we to you ratio is very telling. Uh, because if you're always talking about yourself, it doesn't let your customer into the conversation. And in fact, it separates them from it and they don't feel engaged with it uh, and they don't feel engaged with you. So uh, that's a really simple thing that you can do right out of the gate to be like, okay, what's my we to you ratio? And I know that it feels like it's important to be talking about yourself so that people know who you are and why it's important, but it really is about them and how you can help them. Anyway, um, so uh, I'm just going to have a little sip of tea as we jump into this thing. Um, I've created what I like to call the world's cheesiest metaphor, and uh, it, it really is a, a bad metaphor, but it's great because it really shows you specifically what I'm talking about. And of course, the metaphor I'm talking about is this amazing iceberg. And uh, basically up at the very top of that iceberg, the stuff that's above the surface, consider that you're the outward expression of your brand. So this is stuff like your logo, your colors, your, um, uh, your typography, your marketing, uh, your website, all that stuff that everybody can see, that's the top part. And what I've noticed over my career is that a very large number of people start there uh, because it's easy. It like they come up with a company name, they come up with an idea of what they're going to sell, they create a logo so that it's out there in the world and it's the thing, um, and then they get a website. Uh, but what they're forgetting is all the stuff underneath, which is really critical because if you don't have that stuff underneath, that iceberg is just going to flip over, right? So. Uh, hence the world's cheesiest metaphor. So let's have a look at how this metaphor breaks down and why it's important to sort of go through these steps uh, in a different way than maybe you've been doing it before. So it, earlier 
it was mentioned that part of what I do is I try and help people find, shape, and share their brand with the world or share their story with the world. And this is how it breaks down. So I talked about the outward expression being the top part of this iceberg and the stuff that people can see. And this is really how you share that stuff with the world. But before you can share it, you really do need to understand it a whole lot more. So uh, the platform, which we talked about earlier from a stage perspective, there's one for brand too, which I'm gonna uh, talk about shortly, but then there's the tilt or the personality side, then there's the stuff, so the things that you sell before you get to that outward expression so that when you step on stage, people understand what's happening, the circle of expectations. Um, so let's have a look at each piece uh, and feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, again, I might not answer them right now, uh, but maybe at the end. So the very first piece is of your platform. This is your brand DNA. And when I work with clients, basically this is the first place that I start with them. So it tip, uh, tends to be a one day engagement um, with them where we sit in a room uh, with the owner or the owner and uh, their number one and we talk about the DNA and it takes six hours to get through these four questions. <laughs> so it doesn't sound like a lot, but it, it's, uh, it's incredible because everything from this layer gets tested against throughout all the other layers. So uh, the outcome of this basically is a, uh, a couple sentences, maybe a paragraph that clearly defines what you do, why you do it, who you do it for, and why they care. So just look on the right-hand side there. You'll notice that what you do and who you do it for, they're connected. Why you do it and why they care are connected. It is critical right from the very get-go to answer these four questions. Uh, clearly and concisely and from your hero or from your customer's perspective. And um, I'll use a, a, a use a really quick example. Now, this is a huge example, and I'll, I'll use a smaller one shortly thereafter. But um, so my dad went to the University of Oregon, and he was coached by a guy named Bill Bowerman. And when I was little, my dad used to tell me about Bill Bowerman and about how he used to make uh, sneakers. <laughs> so he used to make his own running shoes, literally melting rubber in his office and underneath the bleachers at the University of Oregon, pouring them into his wife's waffle maker, if you can believe it, uh, to make running shoes. And what he was doing was he was trying to make shoes that were lighter. He was trying to make shoes that would support um, his athletes better. Uh, he was a track coach and he was on a mission. His uh, his concept, so this is way back in, uh, you know, early 60s, if not late 50s. And if you run 1,500 meters, and, and this is, <laughs> don't quote me on this because the math is not right, but just imagine, for the sake of argument, that a shoe weighs a pound. It doesn't, but let's say it does. So over 1,500 meters, you have to lift your foot up with that one pound, each foot, so many times. And that's going to cause muscle fatigue. So Bill Barman figured that if he cut down the weight of the shoe, then his athletes would be able to perform better. And that's what happened. Also, if you're in multiple events, um, you know, how do you support your foot better? How do you make your foot respond better so that it, it can recover faster ad infinitum? Anyway, just before my dad was at University of Oregon, there was a guy named Philip Knight. Uh, and they were uh, ships in the night kind of uh, on the track team. Uh, Philip left and he started selling shoes from Asia. Long story short, he came back and he uh, convinced Bill Bowerman to start designing shoes. Uh, and actually, you can read this in Shoe Dog uh, as well. Uh, so he started designing shoes. Bill Bowerman started designing shoes for Philip Knight. Philip Knight then got companies in Asia to build them. Then he brought them back and he started selling them at track meets. Oh. Why am I getting to this? Well, Nike, if they were, if you were to ask Nike what it is that they do, um, I mean, they don't, they don't make shoes. I mean, certainly they used to, but they use uh, what they do is they create um, equipment for athletes. That's what they do. Uh, end of story. And there's nothing else. Why do they do it? So if you go back to why Bill Bowerman was doing it. Well, to help athletes perform better. Who do you do it for? He does it for athletes specifically. 
back then it was all about the athlete. It wasn't about, you know, Joe runner or non-professional athlete or non-student athlete. And why do those people care? They care because it works. So if you look at that story, if you look at that DNA um, that we just created, you can now test everything else uh, above this against that particular DNA statement. So if we look at, you know, the, the tilt of their personality, how they speak to the world, um, you know, their first advertising campaign, I think, was uh, there is no finish line, didn't even show their product in the advertisement. Uh, they just spoke directly to the athlete that we're always looking to improve. Their tagline, which came up later, was um, uh, just do it. That came up much later. It is, you know, in ar arguably in the top five most recognizable brands of all time. And just those three words say everything. And if you test it against the brand, it works. Everything that they sell, also their stuff, can be tested against that brand. Um, if they were to uh, start selling, um, oh my gosh, what would be a what would be a good example? Um, if they started selling notebooks, um, probably wouldn't be on brand unless it would be a specific training notebook. You know, so you get where I'm going with that. So the very first thing that you should do um, when you're building a brand or if you're thinking about pivoting a brand, even if you're in a business right now or you're building a business, um, go back and look at these four things and try and answer them as concisely as possible. Uh, now, my nature is I'm a reductionist, so I like to take things away uh, as much as possible until they stop making sense and then start putting those pieces back together until it obfuscates things and then take those pieces back out again. So if you come at this from these four points, what do you do? And be clear about it. Uh, you guys probably have home builders, uh, I'm guessing in Saskatchewan. Um, you look at a home builder. What do they do? Maybe you've got different levels of home builders. Um, you know, somebody who does high-end homes, uh, they still build homes. That's what they do. And the low-end people who build homes that can move around, they still build homes. You know, why they do it is where it's going to change, right? And uh, who you do it for, that then creates your market. And why they care, um, so, oops, sorry about that, and why they care uh, connects directly to why you do it. And that's how you become special in the market. Um, one of the things that I've found with clients is they're fighting for, uh, fighting on price, or they're, they're basically positioning on price. And if you come at this, um, you know, instead of being a commodity where everybody's got the same thing and you're, and you're you know, working against each other on price. If you come at it from the why, uh, and there's a great book on that as well, that is key to a lot of success. So being clear about why you're doing something and why somebody cares about why you're doing it that way or why you're offering that is very, very powerful. Um, and it ripples through everything that you do. Uh, Nike had a lot of competitors back in the day and they usurped a lot of competitors. And and I'm not suggesting they did brand jitsu. I think they did it organically. Uh, they just knew because the passion was there with Bill Bowerman to create this thing uh, that was there to help athletes specifically. Um, but because they built it that way uh, over time, it is a powerhouse. And um, I, I think it's, it's very powerful to come at it from this perspective and to start here uh, instead of starting from the outward expression. Um, so I'm just going to check in. Uh, can you guys still hear me okay? Yay. Awesome. Okay, I'll try not to move at all. Um, dun -dun -dun -dun. Uh, I do have worksheets, uh, and I, maybe I'll just interject here that if you want those worksheets, just uh, I've got an email address at the end. You can just ask me for them. Um, and of course, you'll have this entire presentation, I think, available to you through WESC. And uh, yeah. Anyway, let's move on. So the personality side of this thing. Uh, this is the the tilt. Remember, the the platform is you know answering those questions uh, so that people can quickly understand who you are and what you're doing in the world and why they care about it. The personality side or the tilt side is that emotional catalyst. So this is how you now connect with people on an emotional level. 
And when we go through this, or when I go through this with um, small businesses and entrepreneurs, uh, there's a bunch of worksheets that I'll, and I'll show you how these all work together. But the idea is that we need to define uh, personality traits, like um, everything from, you know, do you see yourself as a masculine brand or a feminine brand? Do you see yourself as a um, really complex brand or a simple brand? It, and it, you know, ripples all through and I'll walk through it in each side of it. But basically what you end up with at the end of this work is an idea of who you are, like what your personality is. Uh, one way that you can look at this is uh, in a simple way, uh, people do talk about avatars for customers. There's avatars also for yourself as a business, but what famous personality is your brand most like? Because that can give us a really nice rough archetype or avatar to be like, oh, okay, this person would obviously say this or wouldn't say that. And this is how they appear in the world and that's how I want my business to appear in the world. But I'll walk through each one of these things as we go. Um, quick little note here that uh, we have been talking about you and your companies, um, but we've been peppering in your customer as well. So this is the, you know, uh, why you do it, why they care. Um, and also all this personality stuff, we're going to map back over to your customers as well. All right. So the, um, and just to sort of give you the shape of this thing, uh, this is a second day that I do with companies. Typically, we'll do the first day, the brand DNA is a one-day session with uh, the stakeholders of the company. So typically one or two people uh, just to iron out that DNA. The next thing uh, is a day, but it's a week after. I don't like doing it a day after because you need time to sort of percolate on the DNA and to understand all its ramifications. Then we come back about a week later with the leadership team or the top level uh, of people or your your top stakeholders. And sometimes that's a group of, you know, say 10 people uh, and you'll see how that works. Uh, and then we use these different worksheets and and, um, and stickers, which is super fun. Uh, just like these um, to basically map these things out. Anyway, I'll just jump right into it. So the very first thing that we go through is the personality trait worksheet. So uh, it does look a little muddy here, but I think you can make out that at the top there, this is a spectrum. Um, and each one of those boxes it basically has three boxes within it. And I explain this all to people as I go through it. But essentially what I ask people to do is on their own, no consultation with anybody else at the table, is where they see their brand, like where they feel that their brand lies and i don't give any um uh, really guiding principles in terms of what masculine means versus feminine or what elite means versus mass appeal because as we go through all this and everybody's had a chance to put their dots in and this is an example of one company that i worked with and we had uh, five people at the table and each one of those dots represents their choice uh, along that spectrum and then what we did is we came by, we came back once they were done filling out the entire sheet and each person went through and described why they chose to put their dot in a certain place. And then they decided together as a group, and that's where the big blue dot is, exactly where they felt their brand um, ended up. And this is a great exercise, um, not just for brand work, but for um, uh, sort of bringing a team together, especially one that's, you know, maybe it's trying to say the same thing, but differently. This aligns people and aligns a team very, very quickly uh, with a whole lot of strength. Now, below that, you see elite versus mass appeal, serious versus playful, conventional rebel, uh, friend authority, mature and classic versus young and innovative, uh, simple versus technical. And all of these things, so when you think about this personality, right? This personality, uh, we haven't even talked about archetypes yet, but what sort of personality does this uh, speak to? What sort of person would this be? You know, a little bit rebellious, uh, certainly an authority figure. Um, it's, it's simple, easy to understand, but kind of elitist, that sort of thing. So there's a, it's a really fun and powerful exercise to wrap your head around, you know, what it is that, um, uh, your brand looks like as a personality so that we can we, now we're going to start to know how to talk 
So when you start doing your marketing and communication stuff, when you put out your website stuff, you're going to understand the language you can use. You'll understand better the tone you can take, uh, what level of humor that you want to use throughout. And uh, again, it's, it's a touchstone. So if I go back, how do I go back? There we go. Um, if I go back to the brand platform, does, am I, you know, can I test that personality against that brand platform? Does it still make sense? If it, yes, then we continue. And uh, then this personality that we create, when we start creating stuff, we test against the personality. Does that still make sense in context with the DNA? Yes, it does. Then we move forward. So it becomes a, a systematic, progressive uh, brand engagement. Um, now, on the right-hand side, I've got listed here, uh, primary, secondary, and hero. And uh, I'm going to talk about that on the next slide more, but I want to bring it up here that each one of these slides, these next slides you'll see, um, we're going to look at a primary brand archetype and a secondary brand archetype. Then we're going to look at your hero's archetype. And this is your customer um, and who you're selling stuff to or who you're providing a product or service to. Uh, and it's just as important to think about them as it is about yourself. Uh, now, I, you can go down a rabbit hole and do primary and secondary for your hero as well. It's been my experience that uh, it really doesn't have to happen uh, to be impactful or to understand uh, your hero better. And uh, you can do a rough personality trait, uh, an avatar, if you will, for your hero in this personality worksheet where you can be like, okay, this is who we're, this is who we think we're, uh, you know, attracted or, or attracting. This is who we believe are the personality of people who buy our stuff is. And you can do several of these sheets and there's lots of worksheets on avatars as well. Uh, I find this a simpler way to get to the same place. Um, anyway, so once we do the brand personality uh, side of it, and we all get in alignment, and we understand who it is that uh, we are as a group. And I'm just going to jump onto another screen here. Um, just want to quickly look up a thing because my mind is blanking. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh my gosh. Oh, I totally looked at the wrong thing. Oh, Jeff Goldblum. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, so this, uh, um, if I come back here, this personality uh, with this client that we were working on, this personality came out as a Jeff Goldblum-ish type of personality. I just thought I'd throw that in there as a, um, as sort of a final statement on that thing. But I, for the life of me, couldn't remember his name. I could see his face, could not remember his name. Anyway, so once we do that work, then we go into the brand archetype work. And um, if you're a fan of Carl Jung, uh, he did a lot of work on personality archetypes. And if we were to translate, you know, uh, human personalities into business personalities, this is kind of how they map out. And uh, so there's 12 personality archetypes in general. There's four categories. There's four, we call them subsets. Um, so, you know, in the top left-hand corner, there's brands that seek paradise, and that's like the innocent, the sage, and the explorer. You can see that there's a couple of, uh, you know, the innocent is like Dove or Nintendo, the sage is like Google uh, or Mech. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, you'll see brands that build connections. So the lover, the gesture, the everyman, there's little descriptions on each down bottom right corners, you know, those that provide structure. So it's the creator, the ruler, the caregiver. And over on the other side, it's brands that leave a mark. And that's the outlaw, uh, the, the magician and the hero. Just had to look around my camera. Um, and what we do here is uh, I give them dots. Uh, they get green dots and they get yellow dots and they get red dots. And the green dots is where they feel their primary archetype is. The yellow dot is their secondary archetype. And the red dots, which I've added in here, are archetypes that we are definitely not. And this is a, a really great exercise. You can give people more dots if you want. But the idea here is that if you, uh, if you know who you're not, you know a little bit better about who you are. And uh, this is also a great way to bring alignment to groups and teams be like, in this case, you know, they're a creator brand. So they're like Lego or Adobe, uh, but they're also tempered by the sage. So you can look at these personality types a lot like humans. We might be very one thing, but a little bit of another. 
Um, early on in this work, I did things like tertiary brands, um, but I found that when it comes down to it, the ones that matter most are your primary archetype, your secondary archetype, uh, balanced against your personality traits. So now you're looking at a Jeff Goldblum type character with uh, you know these under um, uh, undertone personality types uh, or archetypes. You know the creator and the sage. And how would that brand, how would that person, you know, live in the world? How would they walk and speak and uh, communicate with those? And then uh, again, just to beat a point to death, the, you know, they are not the lover, they are not the gesture. Those are things that the group firmly said, uh, oh, and uh, one person said they're not the caregiver, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. Uh, and there's a lot of conversation around why not that. Uh, now, this doesn't preclude these things from existing or being part of their mix, or it, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be fun uh, or, you know, not be kinder, you know. Uh, it, but what it does mean is that that's not a guiding principle of that brand, if that makes sense. Um, and then we do the same thing for the hero. Uh, so basically your customer, we look at uh, customer archetypes. And I don't do primary or secondary in this. Again, I have done that in the past, but it hasn't really added a lot of value. The most important part about that work is the primary hero archetype and who the, who the hero isn't. Who are you not selling to or who are you not helping uh, on their journey? And that's a very powerful exercise too, to be like, okay, we don't do this, we don't do that. We do this and this is really what we're looking for. This uh, hero archetype, I would say, is as important, if not more important, than your archetype. Your archetype is how you show up in the world, um, but your hero is the person that you're talking to. So, uh, you know, understanding them better and what motivates them uh, is key to this whole concept of brand, this, you know, uh, amorphous concept of brand. Um, if we move forward past this, uh, we look at plots. There are only seven plots in the world. Uh, so if you look at any story, uh, it usually follows into one of these categories or, a, you know, a subtle combination thereof. There's overcoming the monster, rebirth, quest, journey and return, rags to riches, uh, tragedy and comedy. And similarly to what we did in the earlier one, we have a primary story. And this is a story that you are in as a brand. Like, are you uh, overcoming the monster story? And, you know, what does that mean? Uh, if you look back, if you remember, uh, well, if you're around in 1984, uh, I don't presume that you were, but maybe you were, uh, Apple did a really wild ad, uh, you know, around Orwellian stuff, which was overcoming the, the monster, technology monster, the overseer, um, that sort of thing. But if you look at that as what's your primary story, what's your secondary story? This gives you a great basis to start creating some visuals, um, some tone for video if you're gonna do that, the language that you might use in social, um, how you tell your story to your audience or how you bring your audience into this story and make them the hero, this is key to that work. So again, same thing, primary, secondary, I give people dots, uh, independently they put a dot on the page, then we go back and we talk through each one. Then at the end, I give them red dots, and then they put red dots in each one of these squares that they 100% are not in that story. I have yet to meet a company that has any dots other than red in the tragedy section. Uh, it's just, it's not a great story to be a part of, and we tend to steer away from that. Uh, and then of course, we look at the primary story that your hero is in. And if you think about this in terms of making your customer the hero and you the supporting character, um, by knowing what story they're in, you can now basically shape how you write your story, how you you know share your story with them to help support their journey. Uh, are they on a path of rebirth? You can have a customer or have a hero that's going through a rebirth thing and your uh, story is overcoming the monster. Those things can meet and can work together and you can uh, create language and uh, visual language or audio language, whatever, around that very thing to help your customer through that process. I'm hoping this is making sense. Um, 
And uh, again, I don't see a lot of questions uh, down there, but that's cool. I'm going to uh, sally forth and continue on. Um, again, if you wanted these sheets, I'm happy to share them, or you can just you know copy them off of the recording that you can get later. Um, this is really fun to do, and this is something that I challenge you to do, uh, you know, just on your own, as you will. And this is your moral compass for your business. And uh, here are the points. Uh, and the number is arbitrary. I could have easily have said there, you know, name one thing you won't do and one thing uh, you will do. Uh, now, this is as a business. And what does this mean to you? This is specific. I will not sell to um, miners, for example, if you're a cigarette company, you shouldn't do that. Um, you shouldn't sell cigarettes, uh, but there you go. Uh, but these are great things for you to put down on paper and to fight over, to be like, okay, this allows you to be like, okay, these are, we will always do this no matter what. We will always look after our customer. I've got a, a client who went through this exercise. And at the end of it, they're just like, we will always make sure our customer's happy. We will spend money to make sure our customer's happy. In fact, we're gonna put a budget in place to make sure that if somebody's not happy, we have that money set aside that we can fix things for them. And they are over the top, but they're also over the top successful now because of that standpoint. The, you know, And obviously the opposite of that is what are the things that you won't do? Um, uh, the things you love about your industry and the things you hate about your industry. So whatever industry you're in, there's probably some wrongs that you are out trying to right, if that makes sense. And it really uh, makes a lot of sense. It is very powerful to write those things down, to be like, I want to fix this about my industry because it's wrong. I 100% can't stand that. Um, but I love this other stuff about this industry, which is why I'm in it. So I'm going to, you know, support that madly. Uh, and then uh, things that your competition does really well, learn from your competition. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And there's stuff that your competition sucks at uh, that you can capitalize on. And there's nothing wrong with that either. Uh, so if you write these things down, if you have a, a really good picture of you know answers to these questions it will help how you move forward and i'll use an example here of a company i worked with years ago and um they they basically said that uh, they had a, a a fund set aside where if catastrophe struck they would be able to mobilize and help and they're a home construction company when the floods happened so this is back in the 90s so the red river floods happened uh, they coordinated building supplies from Alberta and coordinated them with uh, Canada Post and helped move supplies over to help people that were in need and struggling. Um, and that was baked into their DNA. Like that was baked into how they would deal with things in a crisis. And it is really important to figure that out. What do you do in a crisis? Um, because then when a crisis happens, and it will, you can respond accordingly without having to respond emotionally. Um, anyway, I do realize I'm creeping up on my time here, so I'm going to go through this stuff, um, not superficially, but topically. Uh, your hero also has a moral compass. Moral compass. What are the three things that a hero wants? What do they not want? Uh, that's great to get off your list, because then you don't have to talk about that stuff. You don't have to sell those things. Uh, what are the three things heroes love about your industry? What are the three things three things they hate? Are those the same as yours? Because uh, that's interesting to know as well. And from the customer perspective, what do they uh, think that your competition does really well? And what do they think they don't do very well? And this might be the same as yours, but it might be also completely different from a hero's perspective. Um, anyway, write these things down. This is uh, not only super fun to do, <laughs> but it's very telling and it gives you like, a, I, I sleep better at night knowing this stuff. Um, so the next part of this thing, so we had the DNA, we had the personality and that last little bit sort of wrapped up the personality. Once you have all that stuff put together, uh, you have a very good sense of who you are in the world, what you do, who you do it for and why they care, right? That's your DNA. And then your personality is how you act in the world, uh, how you appear, what your sense of humor is, what your tone is like, what your imagery might be like, um, 
you know, how you make your customers the heroes of the story, uh, what story you're in, what they're in, etc. And then if you take the next step, which is the stuff layer, and this is the things you sell. And you can quickly see that you have to have the earlier things, the platform and the tilt or the, uh, the DNA um, and the personality to begin with uh, before you figure out what the stuff is that you're going to sell. So, you know, uh, what products and services that you sell, if, if that's out of alignment with your DNA, then you're in trouble. If you're selling, you know, um, art canvases and you're a, and you're Nike, this is probably the wrong thing to be selling uh, or the market's going to be very, very small. Um, so basically stuff that you can do is you can create what's called a product ladder uh, or service ladder. And these are uh, different ways that you can look at the, the stuff that you sell and who you sell it to. Uh, and I've got a little worksheet for that as well, which I borrowed from a good friend of mine named Neville Chamberlain, not the prime minister or the ex-prime minister, uh, but another guy uh, who's got a company called Brightworks. Uh, but I'll show you that in a second. Uh, and then how you name your stuff. So uh, what stuff are you selling and what is it called? And does it make sense given the context of your brand DNA and your brand personality? And what people are looking for uh, to buy? Like, are you using you know names of gods like Nike, for example? Uh, of course, that's the company name, not a product name. But Nike, I don't know whether you know this or not, is the goddess of um, oh my god, <laughs> goddess of victory, uh, and that's pretty amazing. That tells a lot about the brand right then and there. And then you know all their uh, the shoes after the fact, like you know Air Jordans and stuff like that. Uh, when it's named correctly, it gets some market appeal as well. But they wouldn't know that unless they understood their DNA and their personality. Um, and then how you sell your stuff. So this is how much do you sell your stuff for? What is the market? Uh, what will the market bear? Or can you increase your how much you sell it for because you're no longer a commodity? because the why you're doing it and why your customers care about what you're doing uh, are now in alignment and people will pay more for it. It's a, a thought. Anyway, this is the product ladder and you may or may not be able to see this well, but basically the top layer is one-to-one. -one. So this is uh, if I were selling to you directly and um, you know what products and services do I have that I would sell to you directly one-to-one -one? What lead magnets do I have there that would attract you to want to like, you know, pick up this stuff? Uh, what entry level products do I have? So what things could you get for less amount of money uh, that would lead you into a flagship product? For example, like a much bigger thing uh, or a support um, uh, system. So where you're paying regular support payments. Uh, below that is the one to N. So this is one to many. Um, right now I'm doing one to many. So this is uh, me, one person talking to a whole bunch of you guys through this uh, miracle of technology. Uh, and then, you know, what sort of products and services could I sell into that? Lead magnets, entry level, flagship, et cetera. And then the zero to many, which will be in a way what this becomes. So uh, this will live on past today as a recording that you guys can watch on your own. And I will no longer be involved. I'll just be, you know, doing this stuff uh, forever on the internet. And, uh, you know, but if you have that sort of thing, what could you do once and never look at again and continue to sell over and over and over again? So this is a great way to look at products and services. Uh, and if you want to learn more about that stuff, uh, put the website down there. It's brightworks, B-R-I-T-E-W-R-X.com. Uh, he's got a ton of different stuff for new businesses and uh, I love the guy to death. He's great. Anyway, um, once we have all that stuff done, so we've got our platform and our DNA, we've got our tilt and personality sorted. We know the stuff that we're selling and how much we're selling it for and where we're selling it. Now we can look at the outward expression of your brand. Now we can start building the logos, the color type, uh, your positioning statements which will come from all that other work. We could, we'll find your tagline in there somewhere. We will not put a vision and mission statement on your website. Uh, you know, based on the we to you ratio, we'll make sure that we're always talking through the hero's eyes and not your own. Uh, you create business cards and stationery. Now you build your website out and your social media and how much social media is the right amount of social media. And then all your marketing communication pieces. Are you going to have door knockers? Are you going to sell, are you going to send out brochures or et cetera? Um, there, are you going to do ads on television? Uh, is that even a thing anymore? You know, uh, so all of these things 
And remember at the beginning of this talk, I said, this is what people tend to do first. Uh, and then they figure out the other stuff later. I'm suggesting that we start at the bottom and work our way up and end here because it'll have much more impact. And uh, that's what I'm hoping, 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 hoping that you take away from this presentation is that you can start no matter where you're at. If you have a business right now or you're just starting one, you can start uh, right at the bottom and work your way through it. Pivot your brand or start a new brand. Um, some quick little words about design. Uh, and I just wanted to throw this in here because we're at the outward expression part. Uh, any great logo, you should be able to draw on us in the sand. It should be simple. Uh, and that makes it impactful. People will remember that stuff. The Nike swoosh, uh, that Nike swoosh cost $35. And it is the most recognized brand uh, a logo pretty much on the planet. Uh, and there's not a lot to it. It says a lot, uh, but that um, that has been ascribed to it over time as well. And then if you're doing your own design, a quick little thing here that uh, I borrowed from a person named Robin Williams, not the comic, uh, and that's crap. Uh, so things to remember during design is contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity. And if you bring this into all the work that you do, um, it will make it look that much more professional and you'll have uh, what I called earlier is corporate maturity. It'll look like, you know, you're a company that's been around for a while. Um, now I'm not just going to leave you on that in conclusion, you know, keep it things simple. Um, it, you can build up from your brand DNA. Your goal is to find shape and share your story. So everyone gets it. If you've already found your story, uh, you know, now might be the time to massage it and shape it a little bit, um, and then share it with the world. I've got my websites down there, uh, as well as a email address. I invite you guys to connect with me if you like. Um, and if you go to makemorecreative.com, you'll see that there's a free, uh, there's a little button at the top there that says free 15 minute consultation. For anybody that I do presentations for, I do a free 30 minute uh, consultation and there's no sell here whatsoever. I'm, I've got more than enough clients. I just wanna help people. I wanna help Canadian businesses because 11% survival rate, um, let's increase that. Let's, uh, let's double it, let's triple it. Anyway, I've been Michael Dargy. This has been Brand Jitsu. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions that you have. I'm sorry I ate up most of the time. We have seven minutes left. Um, oh, uh, the question was, can we get your worksheet from somewhere? Yes, I will put it somewhere and I guess I could share it with uh, Josie and uh, or I'll share it with Wesk um, or you can just shoot me an email and I'll send you a, a little package that you can work through those things with. Um, are there any other questions? Allow me to ask a question. Has this been helpful? Excellent. Yay. Great. Um, I will turn it back over to the fine people at WESC. Um, <laughs> yeah, lots to think about and digest for sure. And um, again, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'm on a I'm on a mission. My mission is to help Canadian businesses. Uh, so let's let's fix this up together. Hey, great! Thanks, Michael, so much for delivering that presentation, um, and thanks to everyone else who was able to join us today. Um, in regards to what Michael said, yeah, if you could send us those spreadsheets, Michael, we will make sure that everyone who's registered for the event today does get those. Um, so make sure to check your emails. We will be sending those out to everyone who's registered. Um, awesome. Otherwise, as awesome. always, this webinar is recorded and we'll have this up on your web on our website for viewing anytime on demand. Um, so check back tomorrow. That should be live. Um, otherwise, our next upcoming webinar is How to Play Big in Your Small Business and is presented by Jamie Young. This registration is now open at west.ca. Bye, everybody, and have a great afternoon. Awesome. Thanks, guys.